Thank you, Jesse, for this beautiful and moving introduction. I really, really, really yeah, and the shelter with growth in the comments. And thank you, thank you to all who have organized the you know, pet and the family and the Thank you to all who have organized you know, for this event to take place. Uh, thank you to you all for this event to take place. I'm very, very happy to be here and to be here and to be here pleased and empowered. I've seen so many people. Um, I know that this indicates that there's something happening. I know it's not just for me, I'm an occasion. But I know and uh, this gives me a lot of uh, strength to realize that you know, people are wanting to come together. And I think it's very important because we live in dangerous times. Um, we live in times in which uh, the system, the society, the capitalist society, uh, that uh, it's uh, the, the ground of our life, uh, it's uh, dropping its mask from the authorities to those who are sustaining the system and dropping their progressive mask and no longer attempting to show that uh, capitalism is a humanitarian system and it's going to guarantee prosperity for all and uh, it's a progressive system. And in fact, our opening acknowledges in very um, you know, young terms that violence, once again, you know, is the most important social and economic weapon they have in their hands. So you have, for instance, a president in the Philippines, Duterte, who declares publicly that uh, he has killed people, and we know that he's responsible for thousands and thousands of deaths since his elections. The newly elected Brazilian President Bolsonaro declares that uh, he loves the previous dictatorship, but the only problem is that they didn't kill enough people. We have uh, our President Trump, you know, who just the last few days has uh, you know, spent no time you know, hiding the fact that he doesn't care whether Saudi Arabia has uh, killed and dismembered in an embassy, you know, a journalist who was mildly critical of the regime, because after all, we sell a lot of arms to them. Now, why would you want to give up that money to make selling arms who are now killing thousands and thousands of people in Yemen? So, I mention this because I think it's very important to understand you know, what is the social, economic, and global context in which we are living. And even where you know, violence is not openly embraced in such brutal terms, and uh, in the midst of a uh, institutional silence, you know, where are the where is the European Union? Where are the United Nations that no long ago you know, presented themselves as uh, supporters of human rights? Where, where are they? It's a profound silence you know, surrounding these uh, statements. But even when we don't have such an open embracement of violence, we also have now for decades you know, policies that uh, are uh, implementing, instituting regimes that are dispossessing you know, the majority of the world of population, of the means of reproduction that have been essential to their lives, whether it is land, whether it is waters, whether it is entitlement services. And uh, this now has been a long, long trade, a long, long trade of these investments, of uh, policies that basically force you know, millions to leave their homes, to leave their countries, and to face very dangerous prospects for the future. You know, the Mediterranean now 
is a mass grave of those who have died living in Africa, living in the Middle East. And we have a mass grave in the Sahara. And at the border of the United States, presumably, you know, the richest country on this planet, you know, where people are amassing, who are fleeing from countries that have been completely devastated out of policies that the United States itself has incentivized. So, what does it mean to speak of feminism in this kind of world? What does it mean to speak of feminism? And this is basically what I'm trying to address to that in very, in very schematic terms, in very schematic terms, because I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I'm really here also, or mostly, to hear from you, not only to speak to you, but also to hear from you, because uh, I've just returned from a long trip to South America. And the sense of, yes, I will live under the volcano is now very, very strong uh, there, as it is, I think, more and more in every part of the world. Now, I think that in this context, feminism is very important. It's extremely important, although I was at a rush to explain what I mean by feminism. Very crucial because over the last decades, you know, feminisms have been created, particularly by the institution, you know, particularly by the United Nations, a kind of institutional state feminism has been created that has very much distorted, you know, what feminism meant in its original drive, in its original intent which was not only to improve the condition of women or far less to reach equality with men, what equality with people who in the majority are exploited, equality with what men, first of all, but uh, it aimed to really change society. There was a feeling in the early 70s that feminism was a move to really change society from the bottom up, which of course, I was very well understood by the institution, not by the left, but the institution, the government were very uh, ready to understand the potential uh, of the movement and uh, organized to, to co-opt it and to use it to integrate women into a new phase of capitalist development. So, important to define what we mean by feminism, to me feminism in its essence is a movement that uh, is motivated by the experience, the century old experience in this society of women coming from the whole work of reproduction, from the work of reproducing everyday life and the struggle over this work. The struggle over this work, and in particular, the struggle against the devalorization of this work, the devalorization of reproductive work, which is really the revalorization of human life. Because when you devalorize the activity that produces our life on a day to day basis, when you devalorize from uh, giving birth, child raising, caring for people, caring for those who are sick, caring for the elderly, and engaging in the many multifarious forms of activity uh, that, that enable our subsistence, which are not only physical, but they are emotional, intellectual, affective. Uh, and then uh, you really devalorize your know, life. And this, in fact, it's what is the essence of a capitalist society. I think the feminism, certainly for me, and I think not only for me, but for a lot of women, has been a crucial window from which to understand not just the condition of women, but to understand what is this capitalist system, to understand that this is a system that in order to reproduce itself, uh, in order to perpetuate you know, it's, it's a process of accumulation has to devalue what is most important for the reproduction of human beings. And uh, it's also a system that has to continuously create and accumulate division, differences among people. 
right? Coming from a feminist perspective, from a population of women who, in different ways, you know, have been at the bottom of the social scale, and in that sense, have also shared much a common ground with people have been discriminated on the basis of race and uh, on the basis of ethnic origin. Uh, coming from that experience and from that history, right, we have been able to see that capitalism, again, cannot perpetuate itself without a continuous process of destruction so that people have destruction of means of reproduction so that people are made available for the most intense forms of exploitation and accumulation of differences, division, hierarchies, right? So that capitalism, far from being production of wealth, is a constant production of scarcity, right? And uh, it's a constant production of, of hierarchies and production of people without rights production of people whose super exploitation then has to be justified with ideologies that you know, make them guilty for the super exploitation to which they are subjected. So their racism and sexism we understood are really structural requirement of a capitalist society. They are requirement to the extent that capitalism needs various forms of enslavement, you know, while it projects this image of being democratic, being based on an equal thing, based on an equal exchange, you know, in reality has to continuously create forms of labor and social relations that are outside of any contract. That in fact are very a key to form of enslavement. In fact, we see it today, and slavery is bad. We are talking, we are told, and these are official statistics, that in the world today there are about 30 million people who are actually enslaved. <laughs> huh? But even without formal enslavement, you have many forms of uh, social relation activities that come very close to it. So uh, I think that feminism, you know, looking at capitalism from the point of view of reproduction uh, has been extremely important to see that the kind of devastation, destruction of the means of reproduction, right, creation of permanent warfare uh, that we see today, a constant creation of division, it's not accidental, it's not one particular phase of capitalist development that maybe will be overcome in some sort of hypothetical future, but it's actually a structural characteristic of the system, that this is really part of what the system requires in order to sustain itself. I stress this, I stress this because this means that, uh, you know, when we speak of uh, our resistance, when we speak of the struggle in which we engage, and particularly when we speak of women's struggle, feminist struggle, right? We see that we have to come to the conclusion that, uh, you know, it's very important in the way we organize the struggle. It's very important to begin to create the ways in which a new society can be uh, created. In other words, that whatever struggle we engage in has to contain within it an anti-systemic element, has to contain in itself the seeds for the creation of a new society. In other words, that we cannot continue to hope that somehow, somewhere, uh, you know, the system will become more humanitarian. And uh, this, this, I think, changes the optic. In my view, we need to change the optic in which we organize our life and which we organize our existence by to the continuous challenges that are coming you know, to, to our ability to reproduce ourselves. And uh, I want to mention here we are you know, in, a, in a university setting, you know, how important this is, for instance, 
so that you know the university population because the key elements you know of the uh, policies the you know, reorganization of, of daily life that this phase of capitalist development has brought and then also the commercialization of knowledge and has been the creation as Jesse mentioned before of a whole population of students who now have to become literally slaves to the banks in order to be able to have access you know, to an educational process, to become to be equal, you know, of knowledge. And uh, this is something that is very crucial uh, in terms of thinking the terrain of our study. Now, uh, given, given this premises, I think that uh, it's important to also see that today the feminist movement understood as a movement for the revalorization of reproductive work, the revalorization of uh, reproduction in a broader sense. It's also one of the movements that creates that holds the best promise for the genuine change. And uh, I want to explain what I mean by that. You know, first of all, reproduction. Uh, over the last four decades, from the 70s to the present, the concept of reproduction itself has really transformed, has been transformed, has expanded. In the 70s, we began to think of reproduction mostly starting from the whole. Reproduction as procreation, child raising, housework. I was involved in the 70s in a campaign, in an international campaign for wages for housework. And uh, you know, this is how we conceptualize very much the, the notion, the organization of reproduction. But like that has expanded over time. And today, when we think of reproduction, you know, in particularly looking at the way women are organizing across the world, feminists are organizing across the world, we see that reproduction has taken on many more meanings. Reproduction now implies care for the environment. Now you cannot think of reproducing life, you know, without being concerned and engaged with the protection by of nature, of the waters, of the forest. In much of Latin America, Africa in particular, but also here and in England. I've uh, just uh, done some research on uh, the movement against fracking in Europe. And I've seen that, for example, in England, I don't know in Scotland, women are on the front line in the struggle against fracking. Then in fact, most of the struggle against fracking are actually on, on a local level are headed by women. And uh, this is true in many parts of the world, the struggle for the defense of the territory, the defense of the land, against the forestation, for the waters, to uh, maintain you know, uh, control over the genetic, you know, over the seeds. The creation of seed beds, for example, is very much led by women because there is a continuity between the reproduction of life, you know, and, and the care for the environment. Women are the ones who suffer most, you know, when, when the waters are poisoned, when uh, an oil company comes, you know, to, to an area and they go and be responsible for the reproduction of their community that these activities are the death of the community itself. And at the same time, you know, reproduction also means the conservation and recuperation of knowledge, particularly all systems of knowledge. Uh, so much of knowledge has been destroyed. You know, capitalism mesmerizes now with the computer, the iPhone, and all the technologies. Uh, in the reenchanting the world, I've made a critique of that mesmerization and the seduction that it exercises on us. 
you know, pointing out that in fact much of the technology you know, that is supposed to empower us and is supposed to be an expression of the enrichment that capitalism brings to our life. The much of the technology is actually based on the destruction of many people's commons, on the destruction of much water, of much land, you know, for the minerals that are necessary for the iPhone, the iPad, and the computer. It's, it's coming from somebody's land. It's coming from somebody's common. It's coming from the destruction of communitarian relations. So I'm not speaking against technology, but I'm speaking against the often critical way in which technology is treated. And at the same time, I'm speaking about the fact that uh, we do not see that together with the production of these new technologies, also we have the destruction of many systems of knowledge. For every time you destroy a community, a forest, a whole living environment, you also destroy knowledge, destroy the system of knowledge that people have produced. You know, for instance, in the past, you know, uh, people did not buy pills when the, for malaria in many parts of Africa because they knew the herbs that could cure you uh, if you were beaten by a mosquito. But today, those herbs are not there any longer. Those plants, those rules, all those systems of knowledge, you know, that uh, give you direct access to, to, to help, to forms of treatment without necessarily passing for the medical professions. All the system of knowledge have been lost because the forests are shrinking, because the metals are being destroyed, etc. etc. So but now we have a movement of women and I've seen that in many parts of the world, certainly throughout Latin America, that are making that as a terrain of struggle. And are making that as a terrain of struggle and struggle over the production. So the struggle over the production is expanding, you know, in ways that we certainly did not imagine in the 1970s. Again, the reconstruction of memory. Now I think it's an understanding that uh, to reconstruct the collective memory, to reconstruct the collective memory is crucial. Because you know, when you live in an environment that uh, is totally abstract, and I'm, not, I'm doing this not to, to, to point to this serious room, but when you live in a completely abstract environment, right, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's disempowering. It's disempowering. This is something, for example, that uh, urban planners and politicians and you know, authorities have learned very well in the United States, you know, with the creation of an architectural and urban plan that is systematically built, you know, on the destruction of anything that reminds you of, of what came before you, that reminds you of, of the past, except all, all, all that creates Right, or that is structured in a way to show the inevitability of rule, the inevitability of their rule. So the question of recreating the collective memory and the power of memory, this is also becoming a key terrain of struggle, and a key terrain of struggle over the production. Because that to, to understand, to connect yourself you know, to the world and to the struggle, of those who came before you, it's a great power. It's a great power that enables you to resist. It enables you to see that you, know, you are part of something that is broader than you, that is broader of your life, and this gives you courage. Because when you see your life in the very um, isolating terms, you know, as something that, as a little island, as a little island, you know, disconnected from the national world and disconnected, you know, from other people. And you grew up in an environment where other people are presented to you as a threat, right? As somebody so who you have to defend yourself, you know, and you, you lose a sense of power that comes from your relationship with other people. That's a great loss. That's a great loss. And to recreate that, that structure of memories, 
that connects you to a place, that makes a place a living organism, something that speaks to you. Uh, it's, it's a ground of sorrow. And uh, as I mentioned in an article in, uh, in Reenchanting the World, the book that they just published, you know, um, women that I've spoken to in, uh, in Mexico and who have uh, basically been very involved in the struggle over maintaining communitarian relations. They have noticed that in those places where people had more intense you know, the memory of the past, they connect themselves to previous battles, uh, are capable of connecting themselves to previous battles. Their capacity of resistance is stronger. Their capacity of resistance is much stronger. So uh, this is one of the reasons <coughs> Why, for instance, for me, it has been so crucial you know, to go back to the history of capitalism and to reconstruct you know, the history you know, of women, and particularly the history of the witch hunts. You know? And uh, you know, I have to say that uh, also Scotland you know, has been a major, major area of witch hunting and one of my hopes you know, in giving these talks also is to inspire and, and, and in my writing is also to inspire new generation of people and women across the world and new generations to, to go back to reconnect with that history because I think that that history throws a lot of light also on what's happening on the present. You know, for me it was a revelation, certainly a revelation at the time in the 70s and 80s and after, when I was trying to make sense of the world, when I was trying to make sense, you know, you have this desire to work, you have this desire to break, particularly as a woman when you, you know, when you're raised in a very patriarchal way. And then you say, oh my God, what is that I'm revolting against? You know, what is this system? What is this society? And so for me, to do that work, you know, to see the development of the population, and to me, in that story, you know, to encounter the fact that at one point in that story of the development of capitalism, you know, hundreds of thousands of women were publicly burned, you know, after being tortured to death, you know, in the, in the squares of Europe. In, in, in public, in public, think of what it would be today, you know, to have one woman, you know, in a square of uh, Edinburgh or Dublin, right, in front of everybody, with the body telling you, come, come, come to see, you have to come to see, they're burning the waves, right, and think of what it meant. That there was a time when much smaller population, much, much smaller population, you know, you had perhaps year after year, you had sometimes one, two, three, four or more women, like, burned, arrested. Think of the terror, of the terror to which women were subjected. And then you go and you see what was the process that led a woman to be named a witch and to be brought to the execution place and to be burnt in the square. And uh, that had a profound effect on my understanding of what is capitalist society. A profound effect also to understand the kind of cruelty, the kind of cruelty that has become practically institutionalized in, in the ruling classes, in the political authorities. Uh, and why I, part of my work today Part of my uh, political work is it's also trying to tell and inspire inside, you know, uh, other women to do their work. For instance, I have a project now, you know, with uh, women in Spain. This is the project that is most advanced, uh, where we we begin to do their work. We begin to go visiting areas in which execution took place 
and see what is happening in those areas today. And what we discovered has been very, very interesting. Uh, we discovered that, in fact, today, there is tourism is made. Tourism is made out of uh, the burning of the witch. They are, in fact, selling. They are, in fact, making money. You know, you can go, for example, at the border between uh, in Basque country, at the border between Spain and France, and on the two sides of the borders, you will see shops full of witches, right? With their teeth out of the mouth, the satanic smile, all for 30 euros. For 30 euros, you can bring yourself home on a car or, uh, you know, as a dog, you have all these dogs, you know, with the broom, with the big hat. Nothing, it's like a joke, the big joke. It's a big joke. And the children go with a little brujita in their hands. And we went to the shops and we told the women who sell these things because it's mostly women. Hey, you know what? These women were born. These women were touched to death. And you read, if you read the story, you would uh, be so upset to imagine that now people are selling this like a tourist type. And imagine selling, you know, puppets or, 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 or the dolls of people that dress with the uniform of Auschwitz. Imagine the connection is not made. It's okay to, to actually sell the image of the witch. Everybody will be modified if in some place, you know, in, in near Auschwitz, you have a shop selling for 30 euro, right? And a person dressed with a uniform of Auschwitz, right? Would you, would you agree that they'll be horrified? But nobody is horrified thinking this is how much the story of the witches has been distorted. This is how much it has been hidden, distorted, mythologized. How much the blood and the suffering of thousands and thousands of women has been sold for nothing and endured except by few historians. So, one of my work is in fact uh, basically telling, no, we have to go back. And they say, you know, the what is not is forgotten, is to be repeated. And today it is being repeated. Today in many parts of the world, in Africa, in India, in fact, you have a return of witch hunts. You have a return of actually charges moved against women and uh, execution, at times even public execution of women accused of being witches. And uh, having done the work in Taliban and the witch has been very important because now I can understand that today's witch hunt, which uh, have come to me as an incredible surprise and pain, are not unconnected to the witch hunts of the past. Because like the witch hunts of the 16th and 17th century, today as well, they are very connected with the expansion of capitalist relations. And with the fact that the expansion of capitalist relation requires the destruction of many forms of reproduction, and then requires the extension of the control of the state and capital over the body of women. And then, so there is not a coincidence that today in so many African countries and uh, in India, and now it's happening in East Timor, Papua New Guinea. You have again the child of witchcraft coming back. And then you have all over the world an uh, invasion of evangelical sects, Pentecostal and other side, who are now saying that well, poverty is a satanic. If there is poverty, not because of the IMF, or the expansion of capitalism, because of the oil company, etc., etc., because capitalism needs the poor, but because Satan is out in the world, and uh, there are people in the community that are, in fact, uh, you know, doing evil mess. And so, again, as in the 16th century, you know, we have a kind of propaganda that at the moment when people are being attacked in the, 
we can attack the, uh, it directly to the means of reproduction, right? The suspicion of the soul among them, which divides them, which weakens their resistance, which makes them fight against each other, and it particularly concentrate, you know, their rage against the witch, right? So I want to conclude and say, that uh, it's very important, the work that uh, so many women are doing now across the world, precisely around the question of reproduction, which really brings together a broad range of struggles, right? Struggles over procreation, struggles over child raising, struggle over the organization of day-to-day -day reproductive work, you know, which is becoming in many areas more cooperative, you know, because to break out of the isolation in which uh, housework, reproductive work has been traditionally done, it's crucial not only for guaranteeing our survival, but also for strengthening our struggle. Right? And so this, in fact, is beginning to happen. We begin to see it in many areas, particularly among people who have been expelled from you know, their community, forced to migrate to the towns, yeah, you find it, for instance, in places like the peripheries of Argentina or Chile or uh, Peru. You begin to see new forms of reproductive work being organized that are far more cooperative, for example, popular kitchens, urban farming, urban gardens. Uh, you have the example in Colombia of the communitarian mothers. You know, women are now taking care of a lot of children that uh, are in the streets, but are beginning to actually take responsibility for those children. So there is a move now for what I say, I would call the common of the productive work. And uh, to conclude, I would say that this is very important not only for our survival, not only for the survival of large number of people, you know, whose uh, life are immediately put in danger and in question, you know, by the expansion of capitalism, but also important for the start. Because you cannot build, you know, organization, struggle, forms of resistance on a longer period. You cannot give them continuity unless you create, you know, a reproductive basis for it. In other words, a reproductive, changing the way we reproduce ourselves is important not only for survival, but is important also for our struggle. Struggles need and reproductive structure. They need the creation of you know, forms of relation that bring people together, that uh, based on collective work, that uh, create forms of solidarity, collective solidarity, and above all, effective relation. I think one of the great power of women's organization is the fact that uh, they are more and more based on uh, affectivity, on emotional ties, on a sense of solidarity. And that comes from working together. That comes from putting each other's life in common. Thank you very much. So we now have a good time for questions and comments.
very old. So yeah, no, no, I'm fine. <laughs> Uh, we have time for questions and comments. Um, and one thing I know that it's important to be is um, that also it's an opportunity for us to share um, tactics and practices you know, uh, that are probably happening in the city that would be forms of reproduction and s sustaining this sense of, of revolution in the moment or the revolution of every day for everyday life to reproduction. So people are very welcome to, to speak about that. Some questions that I had to start actually that's an idea was um, this idea around um, students as being the site of capitalist exploitation. And I, I, I'm, I'm a teacher and an educator myself, and it's something I've felt very um, broad about working in education for the last 10 years in terms of how students approach their education, the kind of world that they're under in terms of having access to housing and having to work as well in a full-time job as well as accessing education. And it wasn't something that I was exposed to because I, I ended up in education with this little kind of minute of time where they suspended fees at this moment of like two weeks of prosperity that we had now. <laughs> But one of the things that I found quite inspiring about your talk today was, and I haven't made this link before between education and the wages for health work movements in the 1970s, and perhaps one of the reasons why students are so exploited is because they're considered to be a resource as a consumer, their, their labour is considered a consumer resource for capitalism. And perhaps taking inspiration from the 1970s wages for housework movement, perhaps students could start to think of themselves as workers rather than consumers uh -huh. and demand a wage for education rather than, you know, that, that there's sort a of payment by the consumer into the system of education that perhaps wages for students could be a radical movement to shift. Well, we had that. Actually, we had that. You know, in the 70s, I think in very interesting. Actually, I'm a book. I didn't bring it because I was bringing other books. But uh, I have a booklet that a number of people have made in uh, two booklets, actually, that if you're interested, you are online, and I can send it to you, everybody who's interested. Two books that I think are very interesting for people involved in students. Well. One is uh, it's a book about wages for students. In the 70s, that was one of the demands. It was a demand in Italy, where in the student movement they fought for the three salarios. The three salario meant the three ways. They call it the three ways. But basically, it was based on the idea that hey, we go to school, we go to the university, not necessarily because we want to go to the university, because we can produce knowledge and learn outside of the institution thing well, but because they're telling us that unless we have a degree, unless we have a certificate, right, we will be sweeping streets for the rest of our lives. And in fact, that kind of argument has become more and more prominent. Today, you hear it almost every politician will say, oh, unemployment is because we don't have a qualified workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So they say to you, yes, we have to so have a qualified workforce. But, but today, whereas in the 70s, you know, the state, and here is a very Good question to understand why. Uh, there's a whole question of the relationship between, you know, in the in the 70s, you know, the United States, you know, was still perhaps you know competing with the with the Soviet Union. In any case, in, until the 70s, they still recognize, right, that education was important for the system. That a more educated, formally educated workforce was better for productivity, the productivity of labor, was better for democracy, you know, generated forms of consent, right? Then, then you have an important change, and likely that change was also prompted by the, you know, response against student struggles. I, and one of the responses was make them work. Make them work in such a way that they will have no time for any thinking short of work, 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 work. And in fact, it is what is happening. So instead of the subsidies to education, 
right? You have now the introduction of things. So whereas until the, in the United States, the late 70s, until the late 70s, social education and other forms of education were heavily subsidized by the state. Then, 76 in New York, everything ends, you know, open admission ends, and they introduce the fees. And today, the fees are so high that the average student in the U.S. And exits with $30,000, $40,000 of debt. And most of them will not be able to buy, to get the job, enabling them to pay for it, and they will carry that debt for a long, long time. And it's the only debt in the United States for which you cannot claim bankruptcy. So if you die and your parents have had the misfortune of signing the contract with the bank or with the government, they will have to pay for you. And we already have a situation where many seniors are losing their social security because they, they signed you know, the, the contract their children could not pay, and now the government is taking away their social pension. This is what is happening, right? So there's been a struggle. There's been a struggle. You know, so I'm saying now the struggle is against the debt, and the struggle is, is taking place, and it's very, very important. Because the struggle against the debt, you know, in many ways, it's also a struggle against the commercialization of education. You know, the education now is seen as a good, as a, as a commodity. Universities are selling a good, right? And this is having an impact, a very, very important impact also on the quality of education, on the kind of knowledge that is produced. And I could say a lot more because I think that it's a university teacher for many, many, many years. And what I've seen in the last year, now I'm happy to retire. But uh, one of the last who could retire with a pension, right? So today is becoming more and more difficult for teachers to retire with a pension. Right? So the struggle of students is very, very important because it is a struggle, right? Not only a struggle to, um, you know, against solitude, right? But it's also a struggle concerning the quality of education. It's a struggle concerning the production of knowledge. Right? What are the conditions of that product? Because the moment the knowledge becomes a commodity, also the content of the knowledge is deeply affected. And we've seen that every day. So I was talking about two books, and one is about qualitative posturing that it produced by you know, people in the United States involved in the student struggle. And the other is a book that is called The Debt Resistance Manual. It's a handbook about resistance to debt. And a very interesting book, because it looks at the politics of debt, showing that debt has become a politics. Why? Because the struggle against debt that is a form of exploitation. But the struggle against that is much more difficult than the struggle of our wages. When you are in the wage struggle, you're part of a collectivity. You know, the fact that you're exploited and you, you're a worker and then there is the boss. You know, it's very clear there is an exploitative relation. And you're part of a group that has a collective sense. When you are dealing with that, that is very different. It's still exploitative because you have to work much more in order to pay your debt. But at the same time, that is very individualizing. First of all, people feel guilty. They feel, oh, maybe I mismanaged. See, this is all we have learned from the struggle in the United States, you know, from student movements against that. Right? Discovering that ah, people don't come forward because they feel guilty. When you have a debt, you immediately think, many think, it's my fault. Right? I didn't manage well the money. 
I told Tomas, I didn't do the thing. Secondly, it's you and the bank. You know, you're facing the death, and you're facing the, the death in isolation. You're not, even if you know the other people are the death, right? You don't have around you the kind of collectivity that you have, you know, when you have in a struggle of other wages. So we have discovered that that it's really a political dimension and probably used so much because it's so much more difficult to fight against it. And now everybody is a dead. You have to indent yourself, you know, for healthcare, or you know, because there have been cuts in subsidies to healthcare, at least in the US. You have to have deaths you know, around education. And many people are accumulating that. For example, in the United States, this is very, very important, right? We're now finding out that in the US, and I'd like to know about that, 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 that Scotland, the largest number of people with students who have that is the so-called working woman. I say so-called because I think uh, that implies women working outside the home. And I say women working at home as well, right? But so women go out to work, and even if they have two jobs, don't make enough, the majority does not make enough to be economically self-sufficient. Right? So what do they do? As soon as they get away, they go to take a loan. So the majority of women who have a job outside the home, right? I think so Italian women, women working class women, are, are building up, are working to actually get more and more indebted. And uh, you now have this company called Payday Loans. I don't know if you have them here. You must have them here. Payday Loans, which means they're built exactly for the payday. You get the pay, you go to get a loan. The salary serves to get in that. So this, this, is, this is something certainly goes against you know, all the talk about emancipation through, through labor. Eh? The women, we were supposed to become emancipated, you know, so a minority of women have actually gained, but that's not true for the majority. And so there's a lot of evidence, uh, those, uh, you know, you spread it out. More and more people are indebted by going to shop at the day meets with credit cards. So there is a politics of that. That has now been used as a way of subordination of some agents. Yeah. On the other, on the other side. And on the other side, there is a movement, and so we have been studying. There's been, a, there's been as part of the student movement against that. Has been also a study of what you need for the anti that movement, mm -hmm. and we have discovered and study movements against that. For example, in Mexico, there was a very important movement in the 19 for El Barzon. Uh, that um, yeah, then there were movements in uh, in uh, Central America. Movement, for example, where if you have a community that is tightly knit. Right? Then in those communities that really high need, you can begin to say, okay, we pay what we think is right. This is one strategy that was used. We pay what we think is right. So we say, okay, awareness, not so much, we pay maybe 20% or 30% of what the established land is. In order to do that, you have to have a series of council committees in the community, and you have to have the kind of solidarity that guarantees that everybody is going to do that. If you have that, like in Italy in the 70s, you have a self-reduction movement. I don't know some of you older, um, those of my generation remember, there was a self-reduction movement in Italy that was exactly in the same, uh, took the same form. Meaning, with self-reduction, we don't pay more than 10 percent or whatever of transport or rent, electricity bill, and we in the community decide what to pay. 
because we cannot pay what they demand, right? This was very important. And uh, this is why so much part of the struggle is also building, and that's what I was trying to say in concluding my argument, that the reproductive structure that you need is to create a kind of a social fabric you know, that is very cohesive. People having a relationship with each other, you know, where the reproduction of life and the struggle are not separated. I think this has been one big contribution of women's struggles and feminist struggles. To begin to see that the problem, for instance, on an organizational level with many male dominated organizations was exactly displayed. Right? Here you have your everyday life, your reproduction, and there you have this struggle. So you go to the square, the big day, and the red flags, and the talks. Then you go home and your wife is in the Right? And that's why in the 70s we said, there was never a general strike. When the men were on strike, and they called it a general strike, the women stayed at home and cooked dinner, right? And so the need to not separate the reproduction of everyday life, but actually create, transform the reproduction in a way that sustains the struggle, in a way that it creates affecting relation they create forms of organization that tie, you know, tie and weave a new social fabric, a new community. That's very, very important. When that takes place, you know, people are much more able to resist and to defend what they have. Resist is only negative, right? There's, there's now a big uh, resistance to use resist <laughs> as a term. Right? And more important to say defend. Right? Because resist is only negative and does not convey the idea that we have something important already that we want to defend. Right? So I think that, that is what I was trying to say, that it's important. On, the, on that uh, weaving again, weaving away again of the community. Yeah. Okay. Other comments, questions? Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of Maybe we'll take three, we'll take three and then we'll take three from here and then three from there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lillian. Thanks very much. Um, I heard very clearly what you had to say about effective relations and the relationship between that and collective solidarity and resistance. Um, but I'm also thinking that effect plays a major part in much political discourse right now. Effect plays a part in political discourse right now. That doesn't produce affection, but actually produces alienation, individualization, atomization. Right? So I'm just wondering if there's anything that you could say to help people like me think about the relationship you might hold between affect aesthetics, artistic practices and structures, and the production of political subjectivity, agency, and will. Um, thank you so much and welcome back to the Um I'm very grateful for the work we've done on the history of witch burning and as you know Edinburgh is something of a capital. Um, so annually on the um, castle esplanade we have the military tattoo and um, as far as I'm aware there is one very coy a uh, small fountain monument to um, 
the money women were burned up, which is uh, it's not it's not working very well. Yeah, it's, it's, work. work. yeah. it's also very ambivalent in its uh, signification. And I wonder what you think appropriate justice and acknowledgement of the many hundreds and hundreds of women, not all named, uh, who were publicly executed in Edinburgh on that site, which is still continued mm -hmm. a site of military display. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be appropriate for mm -hmm. the city of Edinburgh to show some kind of acknowledgement and, and dare I say, reparation? I mean, yeah. What would that be? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your and for your books and articles. You can talk about the social protection of women's illness. The changes that we need in person Of education and knowledge 
Right? It's really part of the destruction of the covenant. And same thing with art. Because art is so important for the struggle. Right? Art has always been right? one of the languages of the struggle. You know, I think you can measure the effectiveness of the struggle on the kind of art that is produced or the kind of song, for instance, right? Music and art, these have been very, very important because they reach, they communicate in a way the words, words can go so far. And then, yeah, they, so I think that that struggle is now taking place. And I, I think the important is to get out from the isolation. I think that this is now a thing that, uh, you know, it, and it's again, I think, a political dimension uh, of, of the relation of the institutions to the artists and to the students, making you compete, isolating you, yes, if you struggle, you can make it, right? And so you begin to develop this relation to the world, which is in, in, in immensely depressing, because now you are, you know, the fight of one in this home, right? And I think to join with other people and begin to look at art and art production in a collective way and, uh, and refusing the kind of blackmail that is taking place in terms of how oh, art is your reward, you know, uh, it, it's important. I, I know that I don't have, <laughs> none of this is a guarantee, right, of course, but that's a start. It's an important start. And uh, the, the second question, uh, oh, what, what it would mean? Well, you know, nothing can repair what was done. But the worst thing is those little class. It's better than nothing, but it's nothing. It's not enough. And I think a good beginning would be if, for example, women or anybody could actually come and uh, make that memory living. Mm -hmm. You know, read the story. Read the story. What happened to Janet so and so? What happened, you know, to Elspeth, to Evan, to Elizabeth, to all these women who went to. to I don't think that people really, generally, very few, unless you've read it and spent time with it, have an idea of what they were transported. Say that they were hanged or tortured or uh, burned. Yeah, it doesn't go, it's only, it's still very abstract. You know, you have to read the story, you know, how she was taken out of the house, how she was stripped naked. Imagine being in a dungeon surrounded by men. Imagine knowing that you will not go out except to be burned alive. Imagine that. That has to sink in your body. The horror that those women went through. And then being spread on a table and somebody kicking you, kicking you with long needles in every part of your body after they have shaved your pubic area so they could prick you even in your vagina to look for the mark of the devil. How can you do justice? But I think if people understood, if people for a moment felt in their flesh, what it must have been like to be one of those women, right? And, uh, and to go through the experience, and that this was a mass experience. And this was the authorities, this was the church, this was your Kirk session, and this was your government, and these were the people who shift in many ways, the ruling classes to come. I think that that would be the beginning of a reparation. You know, not to let the memory disappear. Right? To have the voice to make, to me, one of my tasks and working point was to make those women present, to bring them here, so that, you know, I was thinking of the isolation, what it meant to be alone in those dungeons, and then knowing, and they'll put something in your mouth, and they'll burn you, to give them voice, to make them present among us. You know, I, that, that I think is very important. Uh, yeah, I, your question, I did not, I did not, please said that, 
that the care could be enough. Right? I didn't suggest it would be enough, of course. And I spoke of the feminist movement not assuming. I mean, capitalism is it's a it's a many-headed beast. It's a many-headed beast, right? The the Zapatists are called on the they call it a piper, right? It has many. So the struggle against capitalism has many, many fronts. And uh, I can see a movement, an anti-capitalist movement, as having many, many components. Right? People fighting to defend the forest. Women fighting against the criminalization of women who are pregnant, like it's happening today in the United States. There's a whole criminalization of pregnancy among proletarian women. It's a scary. Um, people fighting around education against the death. I think that the challenge is how this movement come together. If this woman can come together, if this woman can find a common ground, right? So the issue is not only, but what I think the, the feminist movement and women struggle in general, and I say that because many, many do not recognize themselves as feminists, and probably many women are struggling today in many parts of the world if they hear the word feminist to say, I'm not a feminist. <laughs> right? But they might be all entitled to struggle that I would consider feminist because I give a particular meaning to feminism. What, what I wanted to, to, to stress was the question of the importance of reproduction right, for the continuity of struggle, for the organization of everyday struggle. The struggle is not only those moments right, of great confrontation, but it's also the everyday. Mm -hmm. It's also the everyday, and how we transform everything, because it's in the everyday that we are most often defeated that we are most often isolated from each other. So the transforming the everyday organizational reproduction <laughs> informs the brain, the isolation, etc., etc. I think is very important. So I wasn't thinking in terms of replacement. I was thinking in terms of creation of a, of a fabric, social fabric, capable of sustaining a long-term struggle, as inevitably the struggle against capitalism is going to be. Yeah. So, other question, other comment? Yes? Oh, you also had a question. Okay. Or, yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, you know, I'm, um, I'm 70 years old and I was a student in France in Paris in May 1968 yes. for the feminism. But I think, uh, yes, you're right about uh, the, 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 the students uh, and the problem with the laws and so on. It's true, it's maybe true in USA, it's maybe true here in the UK also. But for example, well, it's not true in France at all. Because in France, when you are studying in a French university, state French university, you can study for an engineer or even for a technique. So, and you only pay 200 euros a year of fees. So you see, it's definitely affordable for students. So it could be absolutely true, but it's a choice of the states. So I think that USA made another choice. They made the, the studies that be to being a, yes, a, they are not absolutely affordable for every color. So that's important to use when you have a look on different parts of the world. So Europe is absolutely sometimes different. Even in Germany, even in, the, in, the, in Italy, it's different. And another thing is you are relating um, feminism, problem of feminism with uh, capitalism, which is absolutely true. But uh, when you are relating also the rich hunting with, uh, you see, the, with the previous and very, very old 
days. It's still true, actually, because you didn't mention the problem of the religions, and, uh, and you see the problems of not only in the Christian religion, but some other religions, where you have people and men uh, who are just keeping half of the population in kind of inferiority and slavery. So that's, I think it's, it's maybe half of the world who is doing that. And that's still a real problem, because when you are a woman in the kind of countries and so on, what can you do? What can you do? What do you mean? Well, uh, we have no power. If you, are, you have to fight, uh, you have, sorry, to fight the men and to fight the religion soon. And that's very, very, very difficult. I, I don't know. Oh, for example, for example I, I would uh, talk about the Islamic religion with having uh, half of the population under slavery on my point of view. It's so my point of view, I would say. Okay. All right. I think I get it. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Religion. Yes. And there was one thing. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for being so formative on my thought. This is incredible. Um, I wanted to sort of come back to the idea about like reconnecting with and reproducing like histories and thought. Um, I'm wondering how as radical leftists we navigate this terrain when the right and the nominal left are engaging in these projects which are basically just colonial nostalgia. How do we enter that terrain, that kind of projects and not reproduce the kinds of narratives that they're creating, you know, for instance, like there's a, a supposedly left-wing narrative in the UK around, like, you know, nostalgia for the NHS, but there's never discussion that the National Health Service, um, but that's never placed in the context of this was created because of cross war descent and funding with the funders of colonialism. Like, how do we, how do we do that history when that project's already on the way and the narrative is so awful? Basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay. Is there any other question on this side? Well, maybe I'll take that one too. And then, uh, okay. I'll take that one. And then this one, and then I'll have my phone. I was thinking more about um, how disempowered we feel um, since, you know, what, uh, how capitalism has made us so disempowered in the sense of day to day life with, like, you know, we feel like we need to go to the shops to feed ourselves. We we need to rely on the council to get rid of our waste disposal and, and provide our water. I think, um, especially with the vegan religions and witchcraft in particular, we were so empowered to not only provide everything for ourselves and but also a spiritual connection, which is really linked to this caring reproduction, you know, like caring for our community and our children and nature and the ecosystem. And I, I feel like as much as there's so much in my head about how, how, to, how we can move forward, because that's the hardest thing to, to when you're so disempowered to just feel overwhelmed. Yeah. There's no way forward. And I think we just need to start a new religion. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm very, very glad that I want to just go back to the point that you made about charging fees uh, for education. And I'm very, very glad that so far Scotland hasn't gone down that path and that Scottish students can still study without paying fees. But I wonder whether you thought that there is an intention to make education more elitist again. And related question, do you think that the imposition of fees um, is more likely to exclude women? They have other uh, economic responsibilities. Uh -huh. Yes. All right. So let's see. I think you're with the first question, right? Um, does it work? Yeah, can everybody hear us? Yeah. yeah, okay, it still works. Good. Yeah, so yeah, there are some countries that have not introduced fees, although I would argue that the commercialization of education has advanced, you know, globally. 
And uh, I think it's not the majority, actually. The device does not introduce the team. And, uh, but the, the fact of transforming, I think when you look on a global scale, the fact of transforming every form of knowledge, like every aspect of everyday life, into a commodity, right? So that uh, the commodification of body parts, knowledges, and so on, it's really very expensive. And this is what I'm, I'm arguing against. For example, you know, the, the most basic one, the genetic material of life or agriculture, you know, the transgender, the market of seeds, the marketing of children, as well as the marketing of knowledge. Knowledge too now is considered, at least in the dominant neoliberal ideology, as, as a commodity. No. And that, I think, is part of the struggle of education. Fees is very important because the moment that you introduce the fees, uh, basically, you prevent... You, I've had students, for example, in the States who come to pass and fall asleep. I mean, you sit down, the next day they'll be sick, and they'll say, why are you coming to school? And they'll say, well, I worked until 12 o'clock last night. They say, well, don't you just... You know, then, uh, then we'll come to school. And that is the only way I have if I don't do this. So the, the space they would have, for instance, in the 60s, well, you, you know, you might go to classes and so on, but you had the time to go to meeting, you had the time to read books beside those that were assigned in class. Today, it's, it's less and less and less. And, uh, you know, also the kind of social life on campuses is reduced. People have to go to the job, or people are living at home. They cannot live in a communal space because of the money, it costs money to live to have a place, a commune, etc. So, this I see as a general trend, not only in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. But uh, it is a trend also in many parts of Latin America. It's a trend in parts of Europe. So I think that what is happening in the States, it's a good thing to keep an eye on. Because it might be in the future, it is not already in the present, you know, of, of many campuses. Um, and the other. The, the question of religion. I think religion is very important, but you know, somebody, when you speak of uh, we chance and capitalism, people say, well, what about religion? And I say, well, you know, actually, in most of Europe, the we chance begin at the time in which by the, <laughs> they were instituted by the lay of poverty. They were instituted by the king, by the local government, etc., etc. So it was the lay authority that actually brought. And, uh, you know, at a, at a time in which actually, uh, particularly, say, after, after the, six, the beginning of the 16th century, religion becomes less important in many parts of Europe because of the schism, because of the division between Catholic and Protestant. So, but here, certainly, it was very important, but religion was part of the state. That's really the main point that I want to make. Religion has always been part of the dominant power, continues to be. It's part of the state, and it continues to be. And for example, you really see it, huh? you see it now clearly, the way the Catholic Church on one side and Protestant evangelical sect on the other, today are both uh, circling the globe. And they began doing that, particularly with the beginning of the neoliberal phase. And they are cooperating to impose Right, the, the dominant policies, you know, uh, yes, you know, whether it is the Pope, the Vatican coming down very heavily, attacking any struggle over abortion, you know, or any attempt of women to control, you know, their bodies, as they've done recently in Latin America. Like in Argentina, for instance, there was a huge mobilization 
hundreds of thousands of women in the streets, you know, fighting for abortion. And uh, you know, the Vatican organized massive counter demonstrations, right, with the slogan, poor women do not abort. Right? They had this slogan saying the poor women do not abort. And abortion is an IMF plot. They knew the people hate the IMF. And so the International Monetary Fund. And so they said that the abortion was an IMF plot because the IMF doesn't like the poor to have children, which is probably true. But this is not the point. This is not the point. So they said, yeah? So here you have the Vatican, and on the other hand, there is evangelical sects, you know, who since the early 90s have gone to every part of the world. I've seen them in Africa. And uh, you know, with, with uh, the argument I was saying before that if you're poor, it's because somebody's conspiring in your community. They have this handbook. They actually have handbooks on how to recognize a witch. And there are countries like in Ghana, you know, in Ghana, for example, in the north, you have concentration camp for witches. You have at least 3,000 women. You can go on the internet, it's very well documented. You can go and they have at least 3,000 women like in, in different camps for women who are being expelled by their communities. And his sex has not only brought back the witch hunts, but uh, they have brought back uh, the whole story of possession, exorcism. So now in Africa you have the exorcists. To go around from different towns in places like the Congo and the Central African Republic, basically doing uh, exorcising children who are possessed by the devil. And so this, I think, but it's very really clear that these sects, which now are present in all the seats of power, like in Ghana, for example, they have a lot of, of political power. They are very pleasant. They have been financed, organized by many right-wing organizations in the United States, you know, things very, very close to the U.S. government. So I speak of religion, we should not ever think of religion as separate, you know, really from the state. Yeah? The whole story of separation of state and religion, it's really been, uh, you know, yes, there's been historically, you know, in, in the, after the 18th century, there has been some appearance of separation, but religion has been, in terms of its interest, in terms of what it has promoted, you can actually see it's on the French Revolution, where presumably state and religion separate from the French Revolution on, they have always been very, very, very closely connected. I come from Italy, and believe me, Italian history, Italian history really shows it to you. Uh, okay, now, the, the question of uh, the, the colonial, yeah, this is a broad question. I think it's a broad question. And, and uh, the, the way I would rephrase it, right, is uh, what is the relation today in the context that I described, right, between you know, our, our concept of what we need to do to change, to change society, to change the world, so what, and the kind of body forms politics, right? I think what you're talking about, mm -hmm. that, that uh, for example, the, the way I translate it in, in, in my head is about the relation between struggle today in the US and the New Deal. And because New Deal was the great, it's always the great uh, alternative that people are looking at. You have the New Deal, and the New Deal guarantees social pension, guarantees unemployment benefits, guarantees a certain amount of health care, etc., etc. Right? So, for much of the left, 
Dėl to, kad tik tu vat nizertą minau, jis tu gaubėk tu dainių dėl. Taip. But then, there is the other story. The new deal benefited only a certain sector of the population. Most black workers were excluded, right? And the new deal never, never, for example, uh, included domestic work. Even when it was paid, paying domestic work in the United States is recognized as labor after 2000. Yeah, it was the struggle of uh, mostly immigrant domestic workers who actually made the change. In the New Deal, domestic workers, even when they worked for pay, were considered companions. They were labeled as companions, talking about devalorization of their work. So, can we be nostalgic for the New Deal? Or can be nostalgic for a kind of healthcare system, right, that was highly discriminatory. So I think that the idea in response, the idea is not thinking that, oh yeah, going back to the past, but really actually struggling. I see the struggle, and, and, and this is important because it connects to the question you have, right? I see the importance of this creating a new social capital, right? Not only in terms of resisting something that is coming, but in terms of initiating and supporting a struggle of reappropriation. We cannot transform the world unless we change the material condition in which the majority of people live. And unless we appropriate the means of reproduction. It's the point with the state, we can't ignore the state, because the state has monopolized not only the violence, but the wealth. So one of the key issues today to change the world is how do we reappropriate the wealth of generation produce a nature of wealth that now more and more is taken over, accumulated, privatized the destruction of communitarian uh, property, etc., the privatization of public space, everything. So how do we sustain yeah, the process of reappropriation, a wide-ranging process of reappropriation of wealth? I think this is what the fundamental question is, because to change the organizational life, social justice, etc., etc., it has to have a material basis. It has to have a material basis, and a material basis that changes the life, not just of a minority, not just of particular sectors of workers. That, I think, is, is what we're talking about. I'm saying the feminist movement is important because it looks at this question of reproduction. It does it broadens the struggle. When I grew up, the struggle was the industrial working class, the factory workers, right? the communist factory workers. They come from the communist town in Italy. I grew up from the communist town. And with the red flag and everything, but it's always the factory. The factory was always the center of attraction. That's where the revolution was made. I grew up with that. It took me some time to understand that there was another world. And I think that the feminist movement was the first to break up the anti-colonial movement first, actually. And we did it inside the anti-colonial movement opened their path, right? Of seeing no, there is something else. The other workers were created capitalism and the revolutionary subject. And the feminist movement, so it's been an opening and an extension, you know, of what are the terrains of struggle? What is that we need to change? This is very important. But fundamental to the rule is the question of material condition. If we lose control of the earth, the forest, the water, as it is happening, because now we have really the hands of the state, right? Over the land and our bodies as well. If we lose control, it's going to become extremely difficult to escape you know, even further forms of violence and exploitation. 
because once you have, you know, this, this is now the push, in the push of the Monsanto, the Cargill, you know, and the, and the, the mining company, petroleum, etc., is to basically push everybody in the series, empty out the seas and the, and, and the, the lands and Cut the forest, Bolsonaro said he's going to level the Amazon, can you imagine? He's going to level the Amazon, right? Of course, kill the people that live there, right? Big population. And the women are making a big fight in the Amazon. The women are making a big fight, and they think the reason there's so much violence against women now, you know, in many parts of Latin America, is because they are defending the land precisely against the Santos, because they can see that the moment the land is poisoned, the community dies. And many of the young men in those communities are, in fact, supporting the coming of the conference. They are unemployed, they've gone through a long time of unemployment, and to them, a wage, it's a power. So many times the women are being, you know, uh, basically uh, victimized, not only by the, the, the armies of the companies, because now these companies are private armies, but even by the men of their own community. You know, say, you know, and of course at the government will say they are in the way of progress, you know. Uh, so that, that's that's very important issue. It's a very broad issue. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the the question of going to the shops. Yeah. 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 I think that's a very that's a very you know. I always I think it's very important to see that what we call consumerism is really a response to publishing that not only economic, but real, emotional, spiritual, social, yeah? It's the kind of, uh, look, people think uh, of uh, becoming, of, of enriching their life, you know, by buying another gadget or another piece of cloth, you know, because our life has already been involved. And uh, this is one thing I think is very important. You know, I've been really struggling to show, you know, besides this idea that capitalism brings wealth to our lives. Yes, it's like a distraction. Like a yeah, there is, yes, there is like this big enrichment because now we have all this technology, right? Certainly, I mean, some of this technology may be useful, some experts of it, but a lot of this technology has a very double edge. It's built on the destruction of a lot of common, isolating people as well as bringing together. You know, now we have all these children addicted to the phone. You go around, I mean, I see on the subway now in New York, everybody's like, like this. They basically now people live a good part of their life with this thing in their heads. That cannot be conducive. Uh, to a great social life. We never and so we, we really need to be part of people, but I think that the, the point of consumerism is not that people are, it's, a, it's an attempt to feel something that, that we have lost, you know? And I think when you're talking about magic, we're talking about magic today, right? When you think of magic, but the word magic, magia, really meant knowledge, right? You know, magic has, has become, uh, distorted the notion of what magic is. And I'm saying, well, you know, powerful relation among people are magical. Something happens that you cannot explain in terms of, you know, neutral thinking, kingdoms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something very magical in the relation that people have to the natural world, for instance, right? When uh, you are really part of something bigger than you, for example, you know, agricultural communities, agricultural populations, who live in very close contact with nature, 
and uh, in a sense absorbed a part of their body. Their body was in a continuum with a lot of rivers, right? They had to do with the season, with the plants, with the animal. That really is the ground for a certain type of magic, which is different from the specific rituals. I, I, I'm not against the rituals, but uh, I think that the magic is something deeper than the rituals. Right, that the magic is uh, right is a particular type of relationality, you know, to a whole range of forces around us, to make people that uh, it's very creative, it's part of the creativity, it's part of the, you know, creativity is a magic, right, the creativity, mm -hmm. every time the consciousness expands and you begin to see that it is magical. Right. So, uh, yes, I think that, that capitalism kills magic and sells you, you know, a commodified form of magic. You know? Now, half of the movies that are being produced for popular consumption are built on this cheap magic, violent magic, very violent, you know, this human being of very monster, the continuous chain, weapons that are capable of dissolving everything around. Have you seen? I don't know. I, I, on, on, a, on the plane coming here, all the time, there were people watching things that were horrified and so violent. I mean, people being blown off all now. I I never seen it. I, I find I, I now want to understand what this Harry Potter story is. I don't know what this means. I don't know what this means. Oh my God! Oh my God! So that's the chicken rice process. That's the chicken rice process. The way they're capturing this simple, simple disempowerment, right? I mean, why do people want to see? Why do Why do you want to see people blown up around them? These weapons that can destroy worlds, you know, people changing shape from things. Like this is what, why they want, you know, it's like this profound, profound alienation, profound sense of alienation. Right? So they are, you know, counting on that, right? And, and filling it with this uh, totally unreal, you know, very, very monstrous. Yeah, so we have to be very careful about that. And I think we should protest those movies. There used to be a good tradition of sitting on a movie. You know, saying, yeah, like uh, outside, of, and saying, this is not good. <laughs> I haven't seen that done. I haven't seen that done. I think it should be a I think that there was no other question. I don't know. Do we have time for two more questions, perhaps? We don't, we don't have time. Are you sure we have a time? I don't know if it's not a very far question. Thank you. But if it is why not do it like that? Yes. Okay. Put it right to the side. Goodbye, get out of the house. Okay. I'm trying to do it quick. Um, it was. I, I wanted your thoughts about. Um, you've spoken about the criminalization of pregnancy. Yes. And then also just now about um, new technologies. Yes. And um, I was thinking about, I've been doing the research myself into new technologies and running pregnancy. Yes. And it's kind of this kind of double edge where the new technology that, that allows us to sort of see inside yes. the body and monitor yes. the body yes. are sort of improving fetal health. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, of the scientific research is finding adult um, health issues, mental health issues that could potentially be, uh, relate to the nine months pre before you're born. Yeah. So um, the research obviously is to try and help 
which means you murder on behalf of someone. I don't know if you had in mind the devil or something like that. But in any case, in the United States now, as a, as a woman lawyer, national health advocate has put it, if you are poor and pregnant, you are now outside of the boundary of the Constitution in the sense that many times can be put it to you that no other person in the country could be you know, accused of. So that, this is what I mean by criminalization. It's a way of uh, sterilizing women in a way without calling sterilization. Because it's become, and what is happening also, which really connects the present to the witch hunts and what I wrote in Caliban and the witch, what I found out, they are creating a system of surveillance in many places where uh, the, the doctors have to report to the police if a woman is pregnant goes to them and they find something not right, like she's doing things that are detrimental to the fetus, then the doctor has to tell the police, oh, if anything happens, risk losing you know, their license. And the same for for uh, for nurses. And now doctors and nurses are having uh, they are having a session with the police because in some cases the police is teaching the doctor how to make blood tests so that the blood test can be used in a cold case because there's obviously different ways of doing a blood test, and some ways are more congenial to be used 
if you have a cold situation, then rather. So it's a very, very dangerous and very systematic you know, situation. Those technologies, I think you're right. You know, uh, those technologies, God knows, yeah, what is their relationship? And it's not even a question of health. Right? Because once you know, it creates, I mean, it's very complicated what the use of the technology does. But so that it increases, right? It, it may save some life, but on another level also brings a whole new problematic about what to do. We know that in India, that technology has been very instrumental to the abortion of female synthesis. Right? So then now you can abort it, uh, yeah. And so it, it's very, it, yeah, it's very questionable. Yeah, it's not necessarily all for the well-being of the mother. Yeah. You know, important to have a critical eye on that. So thank you so much. Um, Yeah, so I'm not so